Well, um, good morning or good afternoon or good evening from wherever uh, in the world you may be joining us today uh, on Zoom. A warm welcome also to everyone here in our IES meeting room. And my name is uh, Jeroen de Wolf, I'm the director of the Institute of European Studies. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to a very special uh, event uh, for our Institute. An event that is um, special for a variety of reasons. One reason is, of course, the topic that is so important for us to discuss um, at this present moment. Um, another reason is that we have such a highly prestigious uh, speaker with us today, with Noël Lenoir. We're very excited uh, to welcome um, Lenoir uh, to our institute. Um, but I should also add that it is a special event for us because this is actually the very first uh, event that we organize in the context of our uh, recently created uh, Centre d'Excellence, our, our Centre of Excellence in the study uh, of France, uh, a new institute uh, that we uh, organized in cooperation with uh, the French uh, Embassy and we're obviously very grateful for the support that allowed us uh, to establish uh, this new centre here uh, on the Berkeley campus in the context of our Institute of European Studies. Um, I also welcome um, to the room the first director of our Center of Excellence, uh, Professor Jonah Levy from the Department of Political Science. Um, Professor Levy will also introduce today's speaker, will moderate uh, the event, uh, but before I give him the floor, uh, I would like to ask the uh, Consul General uh, of France, um, Consul General Jung, and to also say a few words, so please, Consul Jung. The floor is yours, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jeroen, um, dear Professor Jeroen, dear Professor Jonah Levy, uh, Madame la Ministre, ladies and gentlemen, in person and online. It's a pleasure to be here again uh, at the center of the uh, campus of Berkeley in this uh, Institute for European Studies. It's a pleasure also to introduce this inaugural conference um, of UC Berkeley's brand new Center of Excellence which will, this conference, tackle energy issues in France and in Europe in the context of the war in Ukraine by Madame Michel uh, Noël pardon, Lenoir. <laughs> uh, before I introduce our distinguished uh, speaker, allow me to highlight that this new Centre of Excellence is now part of the French Embassy's network of centres of excellence across the US. Uh, the objective of this network of actually 24 centres is to promote French-American relations through interdisciplinary conferences, teaching programs uh, and research partnerships, um, which will allow to have closer bonds between our two countries. Berkeley, UC Berkeley is joining two other prestigious universities on the West Coast, uh, namely uh, UCLA and the University of Southern, Southern California, who are also, which are also centers of excellence like uh, UC Berkeley is now. Um, the center of excellence that we are inaugurating today combines three structures that promote French studies in Berkeley. First, the Institute of European Studies, in which we are, which is leading res the leading research center uh, on Europe in the Western US. Um, it has an important role in fostering and promoting research and teaching on Europe, the EU, and transatlantic relations. And I really want to thank you, uh, dear Yeroun, um, as well as uh, uh, the Associate Director, Dr. Akishami Newsom, um, for uh, uh, hosting us here today and for the success of this new center. Second, uh, the second uh, the center of excellence also gathers the French department of Berkeley, which is one of the largest on the West Coast, and third, the uh, France Berkeley Fund, which is the oldest uh, of the five bilateral funds that exist today between French, the French government and American universities. And since the creation uh, of this fund, um, more than 500 binational, uh, bilat uh, binational sorry, collaborations involving 150 French institutions and more than 350 UC Berkeley researchers and professors uh, have uh, uh, um, uh, been brought together. So now I have to honor the honor of introducing our speaker, Madame Noël Lenoir is a major figure in French politics and academia at the same time, which is uh, quite rare. Um, she's a graduate from Sciences Po. Uh, she's a, a well-known, uh, of course, uh, institu partner institution of Berkeley. 
she is a seasoned lawyer who has served as a member of the French Administrative Supreme Court before being appointed a justice of, a Fran of a France's Constitutional Court for a mandate of nine years. She later joined private practices and uh, created her own law firm in 2020. She's also a politician. Uh, she was elected mayor of uh, Valmondois, a city north of Paris in 1989. And later on, was appointed minister for European affairs between 2002 and uh, 2004. Um, and last but not least, uh, she's an academic, as I mentioned. She has taught at Sciences Po, the law, school, uh, the, law, um, the law School of the University of Paris, Columbia Law School, uh, and the University College of London, and she chairs the European Institute of, uh, French, HSA, of the French HEC Business School. Uh, to moderate the lecture, um, as, uh, as we just saw, we have uh, Jonah, of course, um, and uh, Professor Jonah, uh, I'm sure, but uh, you will uh, help us uh, shed some light there you are, uh, on, on, on the issues that are to come. But without further ado, uh, let the floor to uh, Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Consul General. Thank you, uh, Berkeley and Diego and Jonah, to welcome me uh, today. Uh, I must say that uh, I'm very pleased to be here because of the prestige of Berkeley and also of the Center of Excellence that is your institute, much before it was recognized as such uh, at the French Center of Excellence. So I'm very pleased to be here today. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, of course, uh, my, my presence as a French has a double meaning. Uh, I'm a citizen of Europe, legally, according to the European Treaty, and the French have been, as you know, founding a uh, founding country of Europe, along with five other countries, but really at the origin of Europe. So I'm here as a citizen of Europe. I'm also here as a citizen of France, uh, because uh, our society, our nation, has a very strong culture uh, of universality. And that's why we praise American uh, universities where there are so many nationalities and so many cultures. But we are also uh, in favor of universal values, which means that we are a bit preoccupied by the divide of our democratic society, uh, which is a great danger. And uh, unfortunately, uh, climate change is also a cause of divide, even if it is based on a consensus, a scientific consensus, that is to say that climate change is not a sham, it is a reality, and we have to take stand to fight against it. So this is the subject uh, that was chosen. And I'm happy to discuss with you. I hope I won't be too long. I have two preliminaries. First of all, I will ex if you will excuse, I think, because of my generation and because I'm French, that my English is very rusty. And sometimes uh, my brain uh, is a bit weak uh, to find the words I would like to, uh, to find. And uh, second, even though I am here with the benediction and the encouragement of the excellent uh, <laughs> Council General of France that I congratulate for his excellent job here in San Francisco. I uh, express myself on my behalf. And sometimes I'm a bit uh, candid. That is to say, uh, now that I'm no more a politician, I tell the truth. <laughs> which, is, which is in fact my truth. So it's not really the truth, it is my own truth, my own vision of the evolution of this society. And one of the main uh, well, uh, cause of this tremendous evolution, because I must tell you that since uh, the last uh, 20 years or even 10 years, I didn't see so many cultural change in my country, in Europe, and in your country. I saw that it was the same society that I have known when I was your age, where now I think really uh, we are entering a new phase of uh, civilization, uh, especially in the Western world, 
and for the good, but also for the less good, that is to say this division that we, that we see across all democracies of the free world. So what about fight against climate change, which is facing the reality, but also facing, and I hope, overcoming divisions inside the society. I would like to see, to say, first of all, that in my view, it is a new order of the 20th century that is inaugurated through these new policies at EU level, but here also in California, facing uh, climate change. Then, I will insist on the way the European Union faces this challenge, that is to say with an un unprecedented legal framework made of a quantity, I cannot count them, of legislation called, as certainly you know here, directive or regulation. They are extremely prescriptive and they are also punitive. So I will sh show you how is this framework, which pre-existed the war in Ukraine, is changing the face of Europe and also the role of corporate companies, the role of capitalism in our society. And then I'd like to show, and this was the subject, how uh, the war in Ukraine, the shock that it created, even though I'm very proud to have written uh, in 2014, in a collective book, a chapter saying Putin is looking at declaring war in Ukraine. I didn't know I was so... <laughs> uh, I, I am. But in fact, I, I didn't expect, as even the Ukrainian president, that he would invade Ukraine <coughs> in a way that was the case with the uh, emperors uh, in Europe. Because as you know, Europe is is a result of uh, the rejections of wars in Europe, especially when emperors, such as Napoleon, the German emperors, William II, the Portuguese, uh, the uh, Spanish Empire, the Ottoman Empire, uh, the Lithuanian Empire. So nowadays we have built this political entity to face together the main challenges avoiding the way the, the wars inside the EU territory. So I will show, after having described as shortly as possible, this huge and very prescriptive legal framework which is changing the way capitalism uh, should evolve. I will say that, uh, in my view, and it's true, uh, there are also social concerns and concerns of energy supply, uh, which are at the top of the agenda of the European Union. But, and perhaps it, it couldn't have been expected in that way, Europe has not renounced to reach its goal in fighting the climate change. On the contrary, uh, it has decided unanimously to accelerate the ecological transition. And to conclude with, I will perhaps evoke the political dimension of the debate on climate change. So first, uh, fight against climate uh, global warming is a real turning point of the 20th century. Why is that? Because we live, we still live till the recent years in the framework of the industrial revolution. Of course, uh, I don't know if you have seen the film of uh, Charlot, Modern Times, you know, the uh, Industrial Revolution with the workers and the terrorism, which was uh, theorized here in the US, it has totally changed because now you have computers, you have uh, artificial intelligence, but so it was technology first, industry first, profitability and uh, conquest of new markets for companies, which were at the top of the priorities, and now it has to be combined with other priorities, that is to say long-term goals, such as safeguard the planet. And this is illustrated in France in a way that I think which is healthy, 
That is to say, to give you one example, Article 18, 33 of the French Civil Code, that I hope in this center you all know by heart, in English, at least, uh, says that all partnerships shall be managed in view of its corporate interest, that is to say profitability, taking into consideration the social and environmental stakes of activity, of its activity, which is entirely new, and uh, this is why uh, climate change has become part of the necessary and compulsory goals of the corporate pandemic in Europe. <coughs> um, so now, uh, how does it work? Uh, how does this work? Just a few words about the European Union that you must know perfectly well, but even in Europe, not all students understand very well how it works. As we French, when we watch uh, Fox News, we don't understand how the United States works. <laughs> but uh, I don't watch Fox News every day. <laughs> um, so how does it work? You must uh, keep in mind that Europe was built again, the internal enemy, which was ourselves. Because as former empires, the uh, European countries were at war against each other for centuries. And after the Nazi regime, with all the atrocities that had been committed, it was decided, uh, mainly by the French and the German, but by the Americans as well, it's too long to explain, mm -hmm. to build a new political entity called, at the time, uh, the uh, Economic uh, European Community, then the European Community, now the European Union, as a union not only of states but of people, to reject the possibility of war. And this has been a tremendous success. But Europe is also a legislative body as such. And uh, it is a federal entity. It is neither an intergovernmental inter organizations such as OECD and the UN, nor a federal state such as the US, because we don't have, uh, Europe has no competence, uh, apart from a strong cooperation between member states, in the field of defense and foreign policy. And we don't have an army, uh, and the Court of Justice of the European Union is just a, a constitutional court not a Supreme Court. But what is extremely important and explains why uh, this uh, movement, this impetus of, of Europe towards new policies in favor of the fight of climate, uh, against climate change is, is so constraining, is that the laws of Europe are binding for all, all nation states. This is based on the principle of the primacy of European law uh, over national laws. That is to say, if a French judge has to interpret a French law, he can, through preliminary ruling, ask the Court of Justice, how do I implement this national law so that it is compliant with EU law? And when the Court of Justice interprets EU law and asks the judge to implement national law in this way or in another way, it is totally compulsory. And second, most of legislation, which is the case with regard to the environment, are adopted at the majority vote, which is totally a federal system. And you have two legislative chambers, the Council of Ministers, that is to say all the ministers dealing with one subject, ministers of energy, ministers of environment, depending on the law to be adopted. They are the equivalent of the Senate, of the US Senate, and you have the EU Parliament, which is a unique body because elected through universal suffrage by the uh, hundreds of millions of uh, uh, electors of uh, Europe, which is uh, composed of five, uh, uh, five million, 500 million inhabitants, which is more than, yeah. 
So this legislation are binding for all European citizens and even if a country, a government doesn't agree, it is in the minority, it is compulsory. And that's how it, through majorities, but in that field especially, and it is remarkable, unanimity, what are uh, these EU legislation. As I said, the legal framework is extremely constrained. And uh, it is, in a way, uh, the um, concrete expression of the Paris Agreement of 2015. Have you heard of the Paris Agreement? I think so. Mm -hmm. uh, Paris Agreement is a non-binding treaty, which seems odd, but for lawyers it is simple to understand, because it's a treaty which defines goals to attain without any sanction in the provisions of the treaty. And these sanctions are provided for by European Union law. The goals are extremely ambitious. They are, for instance, to reduce greenhouse gases of 55% uh, 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 by two, 2030 compared to 1990, which is, you know, uh, incredible, an incredible change. And uh, also, uh, there is uh, uh, in the uh, uh, in line with this uh, Green Deal, which was uh, adopted in 2019, the Paris Agreement in 2015, you have more recently a new plan, which was uh, defined and reinforced because of the war in Ukraine, called Fit for 55, 55% reduction of gas, greenhouse gases, aimed at transposing these objectives in a very constraining way, for instance, to extend the quota trading system to all possible sectors, including uh, airplanes, and uh, I, I don't know if you know what is a quota, but if you say, you, you know what it is. <laughs> Thanks. Um, then um, the, the, the greenhouse gas absorption regulation, you know, to capture the gas is, is, is much more uh, ambitious now to save land and, and forestry. And I, can't, I cannot quote them all because I don't know them all, but we have dozens of new legislation on renewable energies, on energy efficiency, on tax system, on energy performance of buildings, on methane emission, infrastructure for alternative fuels, sustainable fuels in aviation, the green maritime space, um, uh, biodiversity, and so on. So, uh, this is uh, an entirely new legal framework, and my generation have never seen that in the history of Europe. So it's a very prescriptive system. But in addition, which is e even more uh, exceptional, is that uh, based on legislation, the European Union has decided to direct public funding and private funding of funds, of banks, etc., to the fight, towards the fight against climate change. So there is a so-called uh, post-COVID recovery plan, 40% of which is devoted to, is dedicated to the fight against climate change, to projects of European interest in that uh, field. Uh, 200 billion uh, euro per year. So as you know, euro is a dollar now. Uh, unfortunately, because in my country uh, it's more expensive than before. And uh, the Commission uh, also, which is uh, another novelty, issues green bonds. Uh, and it's really a, a, a federal financial system which is being set up to attain the goal of reducing greenhouse uh, gas uh, emission. But more surprising is the taxonomy. So perhaps you know what the taxonomy means in the strict uh, sense of the word. It is a system of classification in natural science, so to be able 
for a biologist or a zoologist to compare the species according to their characteristics and differences. But taxonomy, in that sense, is totally neutral. Taxonomy, more specifically green taxonomy, uh, in the sense of the EU regulation of 2020, is not at all neutral because it classifies the, the, the good activities on, on the good side, that is to say those who contribute to the ecological transition, such as hydrogen, such as uh, wind, solar, etc., and the bad activities, that is to say other forms and other uh, kinds of energy supply, such as, of course, fossil fuel, but not only. So this means that because uh, private funding will not uh, be directed toward these bad, so-called bad activities, it will <coughs> deprive the industries concerned of their possibility to develop and even to survive. So it's something totally new. It's a big challenge. Why is it? Because our society is, is really evolving. And the civil society wants to take part to the definition of political decision. And this goes through NGOs. In my view, for the worst and for the best. Because sometimes there are so many NGOs, we don't know at all who they are and who they represent and who fund them. So it's very opaque. But they are very proactive at EU level, and that's why now that they are experts besides the EU Commission, uh, the fight against the climate change is somehow politicized. You have those who consider that it goes too fast, and you have those like Greenpeace, but many other NGOs who consider that uh, nuclear energy has to be banned, gas has to be banned, and they militate in favor of the divorce and of the destruction, not the adaptation of capitalism, but the destruction of capitalism. And somebody of my generation who had known, I was 20 years at the time, the 1968 demonstration in the French <laughs> street, in the, in, the, in the streets of, of France, it looks like the Trotskyist, in, in, like the Trotskyist <laughs> ideology, <laughs> exactly. You know, to return to nature, and to and to to to, to bread the uh, goats etc. It's exactly uh, that that man said. So it's very, you know, it's 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 become it's becoming an ideological uh, debate. But what is remarkable, it's also uh, at political level a cause which is recognized as <coughs> legitimate. So it's both. And it's interesting because it reflects the new society in which we live today. But the taxonomy of nuclear and gas is still the object of a big, big debate, even at EU level. I won't comment because it's too long. Then uh, this uh, legal framework, whose size is absolutely unprecedented in Europe's history and perhaps in the world's history, because I don't know of any country uh, in the world, which has such an extensive uh, legal framework in any field. So it's really big government now at EU level. Uh, it's very punitive. I won't comment because we don't have time. There are new legislation on criminal offense, especially greenwashing, but not only. And there is a new legislation with regard to civil liability, and that is too long to explain, but if some of you or all of you uh, know what is the Alliance Tort Act. Uh, it's like you apply uh, the Alliance Tort Act uh, to companies with regard to the practices of their suppliers, of their value chain across the world, without the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court of the US, which has decided a few years ago in 2013 with the Kyobel uh, uh, case that uh, the Alliance Tort Act was not extra territorial. It is, according to French law, it will be according to US, to EU law, in a future legislation called due diligence, sustainable legislation. And corporate companies, even
Western Foreign Company uh, uh, exporting to Europe will have to respect this law, that is to say, to carry out due diligence on their value chain and even on their clients. It is being debated today. It's very prospective and it has to do with practices uh, regarding uh, the environment as well as human rights. So it's really a new paradigm for companies and for the whole society. How to bring democracy and protection of the environment across the world? Is it the answer? I won't say uh, how I think it is or it is not, because I leave it to you to see if democracy and protection of the environment can be uh, transferred uh, to uh, very remote foreign countries. But you see, it reflects the will of the EU. Then we go to the war on Ukraine, and you see that the picture has not changed. And on the contrary, uh, Europe decided to accelerate the pace of the ecological transition, uh, to increase the level of its ambitions, and also uh, to decide uh, to uh, ask for the citizens uh, to be a bit uh, more reasonable in using energy, to impose a circular economy, so that, for instance, that waste management has to do with the production of energy, etc., etc. So the idea now is not only to fight against climate change, it is also to severe ties with Russia. And uh, the dimension is much more geopolitical and not only scientific or having to do with the environment, is how we can manage our independence, our autonomy, uh, in a strategic way. Because if you are totally dependent to uh, foreign countries, which in addition are not democracies, it's a bit of a problem. What is interesting? is to see how courts in Europe, and uh, in, especially in France, have adapted to this new paradigm created by the aggression of Russia uh, against Ukraine. Nowadays, we have two principles uh, which have, hierarchically speaking, the same position. The first is environment. The second is uh, security of energy supply. Both are constitutional values at the same level. So the courts understand that for citizens and for small industries in particular, not to be able to, to, to ride a car, not to be able to travel, not to be able to have heating in, in, in winter uh, is, a, is a bit of a problem, not to be able to use your computer because we are addicted to computers and smartphones, is a bit of a problem. So there is this idea that we don't want to have the green political parties demonstrating to the streets, which is, it happens sometimes in my country, every day sometimes, and on the other hand, the yellow vest. We don't want that. We don't want to have, as here, radicalization of uh, the right and of the left because the main message is that when a society is faced, especially a democracy, because in authoritarian regimes, forget all what I've said, so it has absolutely no application at all. But in our democracies, which are by definition pluricultural societies, people having different ideas and the freedom to express their different ideas, you must every day make compromise. And now, what is worrying with regard to climate change as well as any other subject matter, <coughs> of course, the abortion is not really a cause of divide because there is unanimity in favor of it, but almost. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the issue uh, with this uh, new balance between energy supply and the protection of the environment, how will we manage uh, this big cause of divide? But the Constitutional Court. Uh, to which I, I, I belonged a uh, long time ago, between 1992 and 2001, recognized the constitutional value of energy supply, 
based on French law and on Article 194 of the European Treaty, which says that this principle is the condition of the safeguard of the nation and of its independence. It goes very far, which means that these courts do not subscribe to the idea of divorce, going back to before the uh, Industrial Revolution. We want to, 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 to have this uh, impetus to go ahead with new technologies, with new jobs, with new expertise. And it's very important to see that the judge have adapted so quickly to this new uh, context. Then, uh, as perhaps some of you know, Article 3 of the Treaty of the European Union states that Europe, with regard to the economy, is a social market economy. Market economy, we know what it means. Social economy. And this dates back from the very beginning, which means that when people have difficulties, either at national level or at EU level, for instance, the social security couldn't be suppressed in the EU, neither in France, it would be unconstitutional. So you, we have to help people. And recently, the ministers of energy of the 27 member states have gathered and decided to ask to all companies, oil, gas, uh, wind, solar, every uh, company, when they make a lot of, of profits, 20% in addition to what they earn, for the energy crisis, they have to give this super profit to Europe and to the nation states so that they can help small and medium-sized industries as well as citizens who have difficulty to pay their bills uh, to heat themselves or to drive or so on. So it's really a social program which uh, has been decided because of the energy crisis created by the war in Ukraine. So I will finish, because I think that uh, I've been too long. And uh, I want to say that um, when the goal uh, is un uh, debated, undebatable, that is to say, to have a planet which is still uh, livable for the uh, next generation. Uh, I wish that we can find a compromise. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, the European way of doing things is the best, but it expresses, because sometimes it's, I must say, a bit bureaucratic, because there's so many legislation, uh, addition one to another, it's a, it's a, it's a huge, huge, uh, new kind of European constitution. It's very difficult to implement. In, um, in, the, in Europe, but uh, I think that we have to consider that we cannot do uh, this ecological transition in one day. You know, uh, it is uh, there is a usual expression: Paris ne s'est pas fait en un jour. Paris has not been built in one day. Uh, so this is the case. I think that uh, young people who are very militant. Vis-à-vis uh, -vis capitalism, must admit that other young people want to have a decent standard of living and are not so keen on going back to, you know, uh, the Middle Ages, where uh, the big companies have to adapt. Which is the case, I must say, uh, in France, for instance, EDF, which was, uh, which is, which was the first electrician in the world uh, decades ago, has totally changed. Uh, now it's nuclear energy, which is, in my view, fortunately back uh, in fact, because I'm a pro-nuclear uh, person. It was totally impossible to say it without being uh, beheaded in France a few uh, weeks ago. And now, again, no, I'm joking. And now, again, uh, it's, it's, it's okay, even though the French are a bit hurt by uh, the fact that the Germans, who are our closest friends in Europe, the Franco-German couple, are still very reluctant to buy nuclear energy because they have abandoned it and because the civil society reacts differently from the French one. 
the for instance, EDF has totally changed. And here, I know that uh, in California, they have very strong activity in renewable energy. Total energy, which is sued every day by NGOs, especially American NGOs, but also French NGOs, has changed because a quarter of its activity is renewable energy. You have here, I think, in California also, Sonepa or other companies, they, they, they are really involved in renewable energy. Why is it? Because they are obliged, according to European law, but also because it is profitable to foster innovation. So I'm rather optimistic uh, if uh, our societies are able to compromise, because if you want to live together, you must not, you must stop thinking that you are entirely right and that the people who don't think like you are entirely wrong. You must think that half and half, you can be wrong sometimes, mm -hmm. you can be right, and you have to compromise. So I hope that uh, my message, <laughs> no, um, is, uh, is optimistic for you. Because sometimes young people are very radical, which I was in the very ancient <laughs> ages. I've changed in that respect. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Noel, for, uh, if I may, <laughs> uh, for a fantastic, provocative, uh, uh, presentation. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. I do want to also uh, take a moment to thank the Consul General, Hideli Kyung, uh, not only for being here, but for his very important support of the launching of the new uh, Center of Excellence in French and Francophone uh, Studies. Um, I want to also thank Huron for um, the Institute of European Studies support um, as we launch this new French Center. Um, I want to thank Ray for having played a, a central role in organizing transatlantic, uh, transcontinental uh, uh, logistics for this uh, presentation. Um, so um, I just want to again uh, uh, thank so many people uh, who have contributed to this event and I also look forward to more uh, France-related uh, events in the years to come. So without further ado, let's take questions.